I think this image works on a number of levels. And I think, you know, one of the first things that struck me as a, as a juror was it's, it's really just a striking image. Um, when, when you see it at first and the more you kind of look at it and get into it, it, it reveals itself in, in different ways. Um, for me, when we think about the use of uh, mixing digital tools with other sorts of tools and um, softwares and things, um, there can always be a kind of heavy handedness where the, the digital tool leaves its own fingerprints on, on whatever it is. And I think that this one doesn't do that. <laughs> I think that this one is a really quite amazing because it's, it's somewhere between uh, a representation of a real thing and a kind of diagrammatic uh, look at it because it has a skeletal like structure. There's no sort of denying that, right? There's a kind of metaphor or analog to it. But it, it also has parts of it where there are smaller pieces, uh, um, parts look like they've been erased or deleted. It could be part uh, talking about diagrammatically talking about structure, or space, or sequence, or all of the above, and having this overlay of uh, wireframe of what we're used to looking at in our, our own digital tools, and then these little um, dots, which almost look like structural lines that are part of, uh, part of the image. So it's really an extraordinary image and, and uh, is, is really striking. And I think it exemplifies the use of um, digital tools in, in our own representation. I also think that it's a, it's a great use of the black background. I don't think that black backgrounds work on all images. Um, this one, it does. And I think it would be a very different image if it wasn't on that black background that adds to, to uh, what it is. Um, so really great job. I also enjoy the lighting. I think the lighting is really amazing. Um, it has this sort of understructure. We can kind of tell that the light source is above and uh, almost like if it were, were a whale or something like that in, in the ocean, we, we, we understand it's how big it is. And it has a belly and has a top uh, um, that, that, that's really, really nice. And I, so I, I appreciate the amount of thought that went into this image. Um, and it clearly isn't just a kind of hit render and save kind of image. There's certainly work that's done to it. And that's, that's um, uh, work well done and uh, really, really an extraordinary image. Yeah, great. Thank you. I had taken several notes on what you had said about this during the, the, the actual jurying. And you actually hit almost all of those points again, um, specifically with the, the use of the background uh, and the contrast in that, and then the particular wireframe, its skeletal nature. Mm -hmm. One thing that stood out is, is the jury talked about this. One juror ref referred to it as a dragon. Another mm -hmm. one talked about it as a bird diving. Um, so I think someone talked about heat transfer mm. and it, it has this kind of luminance to it. Um, but there was really about the, really a lot of talk about kind of the movement, the dynamism, the speed mm -hmm. of it, the layering of it. Uh, does anything stand out to you in regard to those, those points? Yeah, I think, I mean, that's the amazing thing about the image. It could be all of those things, right? It could be about heat and airflow, or it could be about structure um, because of the, the dynamic that's in the thing. There's small pieces, there's large pieces, there's pieces closely spaced further further apart. Uh, it's really amazing in that way. It does have that, the interesting thing about its um, analog to a skeletal thing is that it's not clearly identifiable. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that was a really great choice. Like you could just say, oh, this project is like a whale's skeleton and you put a whale skeleton in it yeah that what that works but it doesn't give you doesn't open up the possibilities like this one does it, this one certainly has many possibilities and it can be all of those things it doesn't have to just stand for one thing yeah that's really interesting uh, in a way the way that it works in the background it has kind of an object quality to it but then it doesn't fall into the traps of being a discrete object that's easily defined and then yeah easily missed like it requires deeper conversation mm -hmm. um yeah one of the jurors said this person has the courage to finish a thought yeah and i i i, I like that balance like yeah it's, it's not totally finished but it's it is yeah. it, it's well done great thank you chris any other any other parting thoughts on this one no i think that covers all okay i was thinking about that yeah
this is the winner for uh, professional hand. Yeah, the, the thing that really struck me about this when especially when you start to zoom into the image and, and, and look at it, there is a clear facility that this person has with a particular way of drawing. And it's, it's similar to the way that I was trained to, to draw with ink on mylar. Um, but it's not simply that, right? It, 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 that kind of drawing can be reduced into just sort of factual, you know, plan section elevation. There's two things, there's ink and there's mylar. Um, when this person really expanded the boundaries of that, like where ink is on the surface of the mylar, meaning the front or the back, um, there's, you know, gradations of black in it from black to gray. Um, but I think it's really this grid that overlays the thing and acts as a kind of interesting viewports, um, meaning like when the black and the white can flip, but you look at little parts and pieces, it changes, um, changes from black to, to white, um, whether objects are objects or objects or drawn objects are shadows of objects, you know, being the index of the object, all of that is blurred within this and in a really sort of wonderful way um, in which that level of abstraction, even like what, you know, some, some of these things look like people uh, could be, doesn't have to be, but it, it might be. And so it, it even challenges that uh, what's, uh, what's a perspective, what's a plan, what's a section, all of that is, is true within this. Uh, it's really, really amazing drawing in that way. And then like for me, just like being the sort of ink on mylar sort of geek, I guess. But uh, the fact that they use some white ink on it, they use these sort of ink techniques that, that I learned to do uh, where the absence of ink is, uh, can be very powerful too, uh, when you're in these sort of fields of black and there are smaller figures within the black, um, really beautiful drawing. And uh, like, like some of the other jurors have said in other images, I think it's true here too. This person had the courage to finish a thought, right? Yeah. That, that's really important. Like um, the entire thing has a wonderful um, sort of dynamic to it. And I think that the best drawings, like the best songs, have dynamic to them, right? Uh, the, the best songs we, we know are, they have fast pace, pace places, slow pace, loud, soft, like this has those kinds of uh, dynamic things. Are, things are compact. Things are really small. Some things are bigger, um, dark, being going all the way from black to white or black and gray, and hatches being in between that. Um, and when you look at parts of it, um, um, some hand sort of done hatching or stippling in the, in the drawing too. So it's really, really a beautiful image. Yeah, that's great. And you you elaborated on the use of white ink as this like sign of expertise. Mm -hmm. Which, yeah, <laughs> like if the the white ink to me signifies that I, this person knows how to use a repeatograph. And they know that the, the, the repeatograph company made both black and white ink. Uh, and that the white ink is actually can be used to draw over the black or to, you know, there's some ways to erase ink, but no great ways to do it or to yeah. make the absence of ink. And that that's, um, that, that's really, really extraordinary. Yeah, it's so subtle too. Yeah, right? it is, it is. There's moments where it's where you pointed it out, and I was like, "Is that what? Oh, that yeah. is my ink." Yeah, yeah, I haven't, I haven't thought about that in forever. Uh -huh. uh, there's a certain skill to that, and that was that was something that a lot of the jurors um, talked about was just the the expertise and craft and skill, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the balance of of solid and then line, right? So it's it's really speaking a lot of different uh, different languages here, but the skill is totally obvious you actually one thing you mentioned was the grid is a series of viewports mm -hmm. um is there anything you'd want to say about viewports or those kind of like uh, zoomed in or specific moments well i think that the, the you know for me the analogy to the viewport is also has this uh well, for me, it's a connection between like when I first started learning CAD programs, especially AutoCAD, like the difference between what model space and the paper space and the viewport actually being a place to scale things, right, to, to view things. And uh, I find that fascinating when we start to think about it, like when you hand draw something, yeah. um, 
it's not just about the entire composition it's this ability to within that viewport to change the composition change the scale of what you're looking at so in, in when you start to look at some of these like what I would call the viewports, it looks like, oh, this is at the scale of a landscape, or this is at the scale of a building, or it's at the scale of a piece of furniture or something else that's you know more haptic scaled. Um, all of those things can be true within within that, within this particular drawing. And then I think that the viewports and the curved lines and which are part of that that system um, assist that. Beautifully put. Yeah, I, I love that. It, it touches all of those stones, so to speak, right? Mm -hmm. it, it speaks to all those scales. Mm -hmm. um, the way that you're talking about that, some of the line work, it makes me think of the micro megas and some of those. Yeah, that, yep, problems. exactly. Yep. Well, the, the thing about the micro megas, which I always emphasize when I talk about them, is he has a very clear set of rules that do not get broken. And he doesn't break the rules some rules of architectural representation, meaning if a form is going through another form, it starts or it stops and it starts again, right? Or if it's an axonometric projection, we see all of the surfaces we're supposed to see. He doesn't just indiscriminately cross lines. It just doesn't happen in the micromegas, um, which is the same thing that's happening here. Like there's no, I don't think there are any errant lines in this thing, just like there wouldn't be if it was just a plan or just a section um that that to me is like how we connect architectural representation to uh the representation of architecture um it, it it's it is you know this is architecture um and to be honest if you can do this drawing a building should be super easy i love that i love that this is this, this is architecture right the yeah. drawing is is the project that's part of it that's amazing should we go ahead and look at your juror citation? Yeah. Wonderful. So this is this is really a wonderful triptych. And it has, I, it clearly has a sort of historical reference to other types of representation, painting, you know, uh, it, whether they're paintings or there were scroll drawings or, you know, this kind of even pre, uh, pre perspectival views of the world where um, what we were looking at was oblique. Like if we were looking at things further away, they're just at the top of the drawing, which happens on this on this left panel. Uh, we are seeing some things obliquely, but we're also seeing some things in perspective. In the middle, we can kind of see other perspectives. I think on the right, it's also fascinating because at the bottom, we have this kind of section slash elevation of a water surface. And I think just above it, we're actually in water, right? I think we're actually looking up mm. through dolphins and whales and fish and other sorts of things that are underwater. And then there's a surface of the water and there's this like kind of splashing um, that's happening that lets us know where that is. There is a tremendous amount of care in this drawing. This is someone that is really has an attention to detail um and and drawing us into these worlds and i think that 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 was really striking to me is that someone had to not only design these worlds but then represent them in this way and i think that that's the thing that kind of separates us from illustration right the the idea of architectural representation um as as a thing um is different than illustration we're not just like telling stories and, and illustrating those stories we're actually creating worlds and spaces and places, experiences, uh, materiality, how things go together, like all of that is present in this thing. And it's, it's really quite beautiful. Um, I think it was a wise choice to show the people as silhouettes because then they start to become part of the drawing. And there's this like, looks like cloud or some sort of like splatter, almost like a kind of patina on the drawing, which is hard to accomplish in this type of drawing. You know, one of the things that we always have to push against when it comes to using digital tools, I think is flatness. The, the digital world is flat. It's like, meaning like all the lines can and space can collapse on us if we're not in control of that and deepening that. And this, this person certainly does that in this drawing, like giving us the sense of being underwater or being in the sky, um, being above, you know, viewing it from a sort of drone's eye view and seeing or at, even at the human scale all of that is, is part of this thing so 
Um, it's a really, really beautiful image. Uh, and I certainly would love to learn more about the project, but this is really an uh, 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 extraordinary representation. It's really, really amazing. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think you talked about care, you talked about detail, you talked about a kind of uh, intensity and a, a, a specificity and kind of um, every little detail in this is very intentional, right? There's a mm -hmm. level of intention in this. And you even said that this stood out compared to some of the other projects across categories, not only because it was a lot of work, but that the work was very specifically done, right? Mm -hmm. like that all of the details that needed to be done were done. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't look at this and say, well, it just needs a little bit of this, right? No, I, it doesn't need anything else. It's done. Yeah. Yeah. It's, done i think that's the word that architecture students really want to hear like yeah they don't want, they don't want to hear a they don't want yeah. to hear or they want yeah. to hear done <laughs> yeah maybe well, people, not just... people have asked me that about my own drawings um especially the the series of drawings i did for my El alcatraz project where there's somewhere in between a map and a drawing and a representation and a thing like the the question when i teach that methodology and 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 the technique to my own students, I can't just show them the drawing and say, produce this. Uh, but one of the big questions they always ask is like, well, how do you know when it's done? Like, when, when are you done with it? And I, my simple answer is, I, it tells me, um, because I know I can't add anything else. And to be honest, there are parts and pieces of those drawings where I have put a line or a mark on it, and I just realized this is too much. That's the last mark I'm going to put on this thing. Um, and I feel like this, this person probably had a similar experience when they were doing this. They just knew that there was enough on here. And if they started to add any more, it just becomes too much. Yeah, I, I, I think that's terrific. That's a great observation. They, like, and you talk about flatness. There's a couple of moments in flatness, but they're used so well. Yeah. They're actually used to make everything else project outward. Um, I, I love that moment when you feel like, oh, that was one line too many. And yeah. like, you don't want two lines too many. Yes. <laughs> yeah. One line too many is almost like an imperative. Uh huh. That's great. Yeah, Anything great. else to say about this one, Chris? Um, I don't think so. I think I, that's, that's good. Yeah. I love the tension from one panel to the next. Yeah. It's, the use it's, of the white is important right. here. Yeah, the, the white space between them is really important. Yeah, they could stand alone as individual pieces, but they work so well together. They really, really do. And then it's they're not really aligned to one another, but there's uh -huh. moments where you can tell there's a resonance from one panel to the next. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. Great, thank you so much. I, I know that you, you need to go. We maybe have like one or two more minutes. Um, you mentioned something that stood out to me in not only in this last one, but there was kind of some hints to this in references to how you work or how you've worked. Mm -hmm. um, and so in is there anything, if you were to give any a, a student or a young professional any advice in terms of process and how they identify with their process, I know blanket information isn't always the most useful. Is yeah. there anything that stood out as you looked across the work that you're like, if I could breathe this piece of advice to people, hmm. is there anything from your own process or work that you think is helpful? Well, I think that looking at the work, it's really, it's really great to, to, to be a juror for this competition. Um, I've won it a couple of times. Um, it's really, I encourage my students always to enter, enter into it, but I have always thought that the future and boundaries of what architectural representation is should come from students. Like students should be the ones that are sort of driving it. When you're in practice, you there are certain practices that have developed their own language for representation, which is ultimately where you will find yourself if you are continually pushing the boundaries of representation. And so I think that students should really, and I think just everyone who does architectural representation that I don't, I think that architectural representation is not just about representing architecture. 
right? That we should, should allow ourselves to take in other ideas. And this idea that there's a thing in our mind that we've developed and we're just representing that object is not the, the place to stop. Uh, it's like, can there be a reciprocity between the representation and the designed object? Can there be a sort of way of allowing that to, to happen? And I think the way to, to allow that to happen is to let our minds continue to get into the drawing and not even like, we don't have to parse it all out, right? Like for me, uh, many drawings that I do, if it comes into my mind, I put it in the drawing. I worry about what that is or isn't later or if it is nothing or if it's a sort of like utterance, right? Like if you, if you um, study a lot of people that write a lot of songs, right? Even the, the let's say Lennon and McCartney, right? Um, they, they start out with the, the songs and they don't write the lyrics, they just have utterances, right? or they just say words that sound like they want those words to sound, right? So the, the famous stories that when they wrote yesterday, uh, Paul McCartney just said scrambled eggs. He said scrambled eggs. Like it, he just needed the phrasing and that the, the scrambled eggs was just a placeholder. My point is that when we're representing architecture, things can be hunches, things can be placeholders yeah. and we can come back to them. Uh, and whether it's a cloud, it's a rabbit, it's a bear, it's a whatever it is, just put it in there. Uh, and I saw some examples of, of representation that did that. And certainly the, the piece that I selected as my juror citation does that, I think, uh, and, and starts to build worlds around those, uh, those things that they're putting into the drawings. Um, so it's, yeah, I think that we can always uh, allow ourselves as, as, as architects when we're representing things to allow that boundary of what's being represented expand. Yeah, I, I love that. I love that. That potential for expansion, right? That architecture is always the unknown. Mm -hmm. like it's, it's not, it's what's next. Yeah. Because I'm sure we've all had these experiences. You draw something, you, you design something, you draw it. If you have the, the uh, luxury or uh, privilege of getting it built, then when it gets built and is in the world, you have other experiences from it. Like I, I, I've had those experiences where I didn't think about this and the way that light is hit, actually hitting it or whatever it is, um, those, it continues, the, I think the best architecture just continues to tell you stories uh, from, from conception that you, you, you as a designer didn't really think about. You know, I actually really appreciate that, Chris. The first time I was introduced to your work, it was a handful of years ago, and I don't know where I saw it, but I saw some of the drawings from the Trickster Project. Mm -hmm. And you just described what I, how I reacted to those. I went, mm. whoa, whoa, whoa. And it was kind of, I was a quick pass, right? And I saw this and went, wait, 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 wait. What's this project saying? There's, there's mm -hmm. more content here. Yeah. Um, and I, I think I kind of filled in some gaps, not even knowing what the project was. And then I went back and read about it. And it's a great project, by the way. Mm. But the drawings like pulled me into the story. Yeah and the potential of what could happen next from this. And I'll be honest, as the creator of those things, I don't know that the limits and answer of that. I just allowed myself to get those things out. And even when I built this full scale things too, like on a, it's actually back here, this is the top of the, uh, one of the, tr the trickster was a temporary thing. So like, it just felt like I needed to put this thing on it. So that I put it on it. And the same thing is happening with drawings. This thing feels like something should be around it. So I draw something around it. Then I just, try to figure out what that is later or I don't I just like allow that to be in the world that's great yeah. right and it, that balance between authorship and readership almost like yeah. let it be something to someone yeah that's great Well, thank you, Hoon, for joining me. Go ahead and just jump into this project. And like I said, I'll, I'll ask you some questions. Yeah, sure. You know, you know, when I saw this drawing, I saw it kind of, a, you know, very classical in a way. You know, it has a, it's not symmetrical, as, as we say, symmetrical, you know, left and right, but it has very well balanced. And as a style, it, it reminds me of, of you know, a perennial drawing from the ancient world. You know, it's like it looks like it's been, you know, could be a hundred years old. But then when you look at it, it has very, very many, many stories and details, and it really captures you. That's why I think I chose it. You know, it's like you know, it has many, many, and and then he's very well. You know, he or she is very well. How do you say? 
It's very difficult to find these days people with, with a really hand technique because they are so used to computers. So it was really, really nice to see people really doing this because I'm not a very good user with computers. So I was really happy to find the person who would not similarly, not necessarily same, but the composition of these juxtaposition of many, many things in one picture sort of reminded me, reminded me of also myself doing the work. So I had a great affinity to this drawing. And also it follows, a, not follows, but it's, it looks, it has a look of uh, kind of history to it. And as you know, it, and you know what, you know, in my doodles, I also enjoy like putting little things in small things, small things somewhere. And if you can see, if you look at it, you can see planes, you can see little details everywhere. And it's kind of, you know, first you see uh, kind of a, uh, many many things together you don't know what it is but once you look it's like you look at it through it you look at it carefully and you find things it's like almost like a puzzle and i, I find it very interesting this way of kind this kind of drawing is very interesting yeah <clears throat> yeah pardon me i i absolutely agree i one thing you said when we deliberated about the work is you refer to this as a well-organized dreamscape yeah, I did, I did, I did, yeah, I did. You know, you know why, you know, to be honest with you, uh, I, it's really funny how I draw in detail and I look at the details, but I, I, by the look of it, it looked like something all dreamscape in the sense that it's all connected, but it's not, everything is not really logical in a way. So all these things are connected you know how we dream and we dream in a way that is not sequentially logical, but it's all somehow it makes a story. So this contains a kind of narrative that maybe the only the, the, the creator understands fully, but it conveys that kind of uh, a vibe, you know, that this is some kind of a the drawing with uh, some kind of, a, uh, of course, intention. But for those who doesn't understand, it has leaps and connections that is very, very interesting. And, and it sparks a, a sort of a new chemistry within the picture, yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. A lot of you and a lot of the jurors would talked about the, the structure, the organization of this. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, some refer to it as composition or structure mm -hmm. or ordering, mm -hmm. but talked about um, just the sheer amount of content. It's, it's showing so much. And I think one person said almost too much, but they got, they got right to that level, right? That there was a level of intensity and a level, yeah. level of density yeah. that's it, really you know, intriguing. Yeah, for for the for a person who draws details like this, well, it's not it's not there yet, but <laughs> you can go into more details. Sure, sure, deeper and deeper and like you know, teeny bits of details. But this, but somehow, and it has me. But to me, for me, it's somehow moderate in that sense because I've been drawing some things that's more and more so focused on details, they lose meaning, but that, but it's somehow this is so balanced in a way that it conveys things, you know? So it's, I think it's a balanced drawing of dreamscape, but not too extreme, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that's, mm. that, I, I love that. That's beautiful. It, it makes yeah. me think, you, you also refer to this as being almost mythical. And yeah, mythical in the sense, even though, well, I guess it's because of the kind of a, uh, like the the head floating mm -hmm. and the wind somehow represented the movement and all these things like the sun and you know all these symbols sort of you know even though you don't understand it exactly or you haven't read it correctly maybe but then it but it do exudes some kind of a, a mythical plane where it's mm -hmm. all things all things we see is somehow connected to our, you know, our like historical symbols and all these, it evokes that thing. I, you know, you only, I think you can only really understand this drawing after really talking to the guy or the, the creator properly to understand it, but it has that quality of exuding kind of uh, that kind of quality where these, all these time and uh, quality of history and references and new things all together. And the interesting thing is he has, he or she has put in these like contemporary ideas of travel, movement, and all these things together. So that's also interesting. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's that's great. You you mentioned this as being uh, as showing directly the artist's worldview and yeah, yeah, worldview. Yeah, that's 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 the thing that I think uh, I think you know like a movie director would have a worldview, right? A movie director mm -hmm. have a worldview. A novelist will, will will have a worldview, right? A poet will have a worldview. And every artist, I'm sure, wants, wants to have a proper worldview because they want to be immersed in that world and create their own world and they want to share it, right? And they want to make this world uh, more, I guess, more complete and, and, and affluent and full so that people can join in because it's a kind of an alternative world that you don't, you don't really see, right? You don't really see necessarily. So yeah, worldview. I think we aspire as artists and architects to create a, a story, a worldview where we, it can be shared, not as just a project, but as a story where people can join actually into the story and see the you know, narrative and, and then find out what's happening. So, so we can discover many worlds, you know? Yeah, sure. That's great, that's great. Yeah. <clears throat> I wonder if that's why it breaks this implied border. Right, like it's got this rectangle within a rectangle, but then it bleeds beyond it so specifically. Uh, there, I, to me, I might be. Yeah, I think, too I much think this is a it. technique. <laughs> this is a technique I would always enjoy because I would, yes. do, I would do a bridge jutting out. I would do a bridge jutting out. I would do a hand jutting out. I would uh, do a, a tongue jutting out because it's kind of you know how we we have we have consciousness. And then we, we try to open up, crack that consciousness and open up a bit of unconsciousness, but not too much because too much would be uh, like, we'll be lost in the, in the we'll lose gravity. So <laughs> a cracking open a little of unconsciousness. It's like that. And then it leads you to, it's like, you know, it leads you beyond the frame, you know, paper, the page is a frame where you want to go beyond it. So it's implying something beyond that. So I think that's what it's, it's accentuating that, that kind of energy, because if you bleed everywhere, it then becomes nothing. So it bleeds at certain points and then, then that's accentuating. And I, I do the same thing, you know? I do the same thing. You, you do something, you know, picking out, if, even if I make a mistake, sometimes the, 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 the how do you say, the brush pen bleeds, you know, and it somehow bleeds out of the page and you smudge it and then you have it. It's not Jackson Pollock, you know, you know what I mean? It's, it's just, <laughs> this happens and then it, the picture is completed somehow because of this sort of accident. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's terrific. I love your phrasing yeah. that it, it yeah. touches yeah. out of its bounds, right? That's, <laughs> that's great. Yeah, well, it, to be honest with you, I, it's really funny how I draw in detail and I see impressions here. And it's really funny. I, I, I would look at it. I look at the impression. I look at the impression and it's, it's really strong. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I like that impression. I think that's yeah. quite, a, quite a strong term. For yeah, us. yeah, yeah. Any, any final comments about this one, Hoon? Well, I think out of, uh, first, I want to reiterate the point that I'm really happy to find someone who is using his hand uh, yeah. to do uh, skillful work and expressing his understanding of the world or, or, or a moment or a theme. And he's putting it into a, a, a picture where many, many disparate things are becoming into a blend of idea or a picture. So it's, I think it's, uh, it's very, how do you say, very happy to see someone doing this. Of course, I'm not saying, I'm not against computers or anything like that. It's just that oh, sure. I think, yeah. because when you are naked with your hand, with your pen, you are really naked. You know what I mean? <laughs> you are naked. So everything shows. And that's, uh, I think it's big. I think you are being honest when you are doing uh, your pen work because you cannot hide anything so you have you you are really showing yourself and i think that's one of i think it's also being brave by being being brave by showing yourself because lines cannot really lie as we people say when we talk we can lie right but when you draw you cannot really lie with your lines so it's, it's, I think there's so definitely there's honesty about his capacity, his talent, 
is, is, is just, it tells you everything about him. So I think that's why very important, you know, there's, um, it's everything is uh, genuinely showing in the drawing. While computers, you can really hide a lot of things. You can really fake it. Uh, yeah, I'm sounding like I'm, <laughs> I'm against computers, but I'm saying it's, it's, it's being brave and showing himself or herself by doing this and it's conveying in that sense, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah. It's, there's certain imprecision by hand that yeah. makes it authentic. Yeah, and that's right. A, yeah. And then the you can correct some things, right? Like yeah, and the, and the perfection is an idea, right? Joshua, perfection is an idea, it's not real. Perfection right. is an idea, nothing is really perfect. We, we just go on. We just go on, and it, it, and 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 what I mean is that it's continuation of life. That's how we live, even when you try to perfect it. It's the drawing is what it is. It it holds imperfections, and that's what life is about. I think. Yeah. That's that's beautiful. Thank you. I really appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I forgot to say at the beginning of this project that we we're talking about the the student hand winner. Yeah. Um, and. Let's talk a little bit about the travel sketch winner. Yeah, 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 travel. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I don't travel and sketch anymore. I've become lazy. <laughs> but when I saw this, I was really excited because I know the being there and the speed is what it is that makes a sketch in the in the, in the travel sketch, right? You have to be there. It might rain. The cars could be passing by. People will be passing by. So you are in a hurry. But then you have to try to catch the essence of things, all right? So, but then when you look at this drawing, even though at that situation, I think it's it's described. I mean, it's drawn very well, and you know the 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 composition is beautiful, and it's just a great drawing. So I think. As a, as a trouble sketch, it holds that dynamism, but also uh, that uh, kind of composition, which is really beautiful. So it just stood out of many drawings. We had many, many drawings, right? Uh, but this was, it stood out. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. Yeah, yeah that's, you're, what you're saying now very closely mirrors what you said in our deliberation, specifically yeah, about yeah, how yeah. it stood out and, and dynamism. You also talked about speed, that this yeah, drawing had a certain speed to it. Yeah, I think I think because I think uh, when you are when you are at the site at, at where you're looking at the things and drawing, you are not in a leisurely situation. Usually, you are in a hurry. So I think with the amount of speed, but then you try to control the speed, but the, somehow the speed bleeds into the drawing. So not necessarily. I think he was conscious of not bleeding too much speed into drawing, but it shows as the bicycle, you know, and all these, some, some simplified symbols or things, objects, it shows that he simplified things with speed. It shows up in some details, yeah, yeah. That's great, and it yeah. really gives it a sense of presence. Yeah, 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 sure, sure. I think drawing from a photograph and being in real is a very different thing, I think, because I was a sketcher when I was yes. younger. In the, in the city, in the streets, I was drawing things and I understand exactly what it is like to draw and you know paint in the cities and in the streets. So you are always you know aware of it. Of course, sometimes you know you have more leisurely time to do things. But I think you know usually in the situations you are really ushered into you know, you know this time limit. So but that makes it that makes the painting that makes the drawing that constraint makes the you know that the the, the paint. Like, you know, some people who write for newspapers say the time limit makes them write, you know, <laughs> time limit right. is a thing without that they cannot really write anything. So like an artist would need a, uh, an exhibition deadline to do the work. So and those things are really important. I think the travel sketch is the same thing in that sense. It's, a, it's a, you know, that is speed. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. I, I really appreciate that. And one thing that was brought out is you know, all, every year that I've been a part of this, we've talked about a travel sketch versus a sketch from a photograph. And the yeah. jurors always try to look, are there, are there keys or are there clues that this was done in person on site? <laughs> is, that, is that presence and is that speed part of it? And everyone talked about details within this where they could tell that this was drawn there, that this was yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think many people said about the bicycles and you know some things, 
Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I, I mean, to be honest with you, I was, uh, I was very, how do you say, I'm looking at this picture um, as a more of a, uh, with a distance, but I think many more of the jurors were looking at, at, at a very closely to like detectives to figure out whether this yes. was a soul or not. <laughs> so you can see you know, somewhere, okay, they found. But you know, I'm I'm a simple man, and, and I, I thought, you know, I of course I trust what they said, and but I think it, yeah, I think it has that quality of you know, you know, the 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 sketching at sight, you know. I think it has that. I, I'm not a scientist to prove it, but I think as you said, as we said, the bicycles, the, some lines are moving and all these things, I think it's, it is because maybe you didn't intend it, but then it passed by, the bicycle passed by, you want to put it and then it's, you know, you know, that's what it is. You missed some part of it, but you missed the movement. So you have the movement, so you, you describe it, you put it on the paper. So I think that's mm -hmm. one of the, probably uh, the evidence of uh, being there. Uh, but you know, but you know, I'm not a scientist, but so I am not not hundred percent sure. But but what's what's the what's you know that's that's not what we're trying to figure out, right? But yeah, it has yeah. our of being there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I really like that. That it's you know whether or not you know we can be exact and precise and scientific about yeah. being there. The presence of the drawing is there. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned this bicycle. I I zoomed in on a little bit so you and I could see it. I and even the car, even the car. There's a car even coming. Car. Too. Yeah. You I know, love I mean, these moments. Yeah. 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 Sorry, what were you gonna say? What were you gonna say? No, no, no. That's the same thing. The car, the car, you know how maybe two. I was gonna say some people don't like drawing cars, so some people might have simplified it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's all. It's... You know, some people are, try to describe describe it everything in the same weight. Some people describe it according to some weights. You know, you know what I mean. Some people yes. are very good at sketching, but some people did some. You know, there are hierarchies. But I'm just questioning these. But I think generally, I think he does sketches very in, in every respect. Some are, some artists are just good, more good at in trees and architecture, and but they have this regard for machines. You know, you know what mm. I mean. Some mm -hmm. some people mm -hmm. don't care for machines, but it seems that he's very balanced in these cases. The cars seems to be like cars, the trees are trees, and the buildings are buildings, and the signs are, the signs are signs. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. I, it, it's, mm -hmm. They're also drawn so minimally, right? You see the movement rather than the presence yeah, 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 of the thing. Yeah, 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 it's yeah, yeah, it's yeah, really, really yeah, well done. Yeah, yeah. Anything else that you'd like to point out about this one? No, no, I, to be honest with you, um, uh, I think uh, I think usually you know I'm not a good talker in the sense that um, you know I've it's evident that it's a good drawing and so <laughs> it's like I can talk but it's it's already evident it's a good drawing so yeah sure I, I think I've uh, spoken enough about it already yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 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 I think you're right I, I really like that it's evident that this is a good drawing it's yeah obvious. you know this many many things thing. are self-evident you know we know when we good things we see good things we we know it mm -hmm. and when you have to talk about it some are more elaborate than others <laughs> <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah so um yeah I think that's what it is so the next one is your juror site yeah yeah that, this one this one yeah <laughs> i think many people were questioning why did moon choose this but <laughs> this is as i said this is exactly the sort of drawing i'll do if i do it because i would i would find a place that would be interesting and draw or uh, something draw over it like you know how we saw the movie watchmen you know how the alternative reality ultimate alternative history and all that so i was very interested intrigued by i didn't read the text even you know i thought yeah this is interesting because i would always think about times square i was always go to times square many times i would always imagine what these billboards would turn out to be you know and he said something about this becoming you know, less commercial and all these things and i said no don't say that don't say that it's, it can be commercial and it's okay it's okay don't be guilty about it you know and, but but as a, as a gesture of how architecture can become an entertainment, you know, I was always interested in architecture becoming an entertainment, like architainment, you know, architainment, you know. So this could be a, a, a sort of an architecture with uh, with an entertainment quality where 
uh, some architecture would be built in augmented reality without being any meaning any physical presence. So this could be one of the ideas of showcasing a possibility of you know future whatever you know uh, whatever they want to present as an architectural condition or space. So this would be a good position to do this. So that's why I thought this would be interesting. But I don't. Uh, but I didn't buy. I don't buy after reading not myself reading it, but by her hearing from others saying that this was like had uh, you know this is capitalism something. But I I don't buy that. But as a, as a phenomenon of something happening, I I really bought this methodology of juxtaposing, superimposing something over existing always really interests me very much because a lot of my doodles is more mostly like this juxtapositioning superimposing something new over old or existing condition because it creates tension you know and it's always interesting like for example one of the buildings maybe has a, a, a maybe it's all this being remodeled or it's collapsing you know these things all these things even even 911 even though it was shocking you know even though it was shocking you know the 911 even though it was shocking it, but it was it was as a, if you if you are devoid if you devoid everything of human lives if you devoid of casualties if you look at it just as an aesthetics it's shocking you know you know what i mean so if you take that all away so i think uh, also another interesting thing about this build this picture is that because it's dealing with what's known. We know this place. A lot of people know this place, but something something comes alive that's different, and it's accentuated by this because of this disparity. A, 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 a thing coming out of desert it doesn't really you know make any impact, but this familiarity suddenly invaded by something very unfamiliar, I think really uh, gives strong message, and that's I think that's. That's, I don't know whether this guy or this her intended this, but that's what I read from this drawing. So that's why I liked it. Yeah, that's great. There's, there is this speculative nature to this, right? Where some yeah. kind of unknown is being laid over. <clears throat> and it, at some kind of elemental level, that's what architects do, right? Like yeah. Yeah. See, a, see a gap in the world and postulate what that gap could be. I'm oversimplifying it, of course, and there's a lot more consequences and ramifications but there is a there's an inquiry in this drawing. yeah and you know you know you know joshua when i was at times square i felt like an interior space almost the square yeah. was interior almost i felt like even though it's not interior i felt like it's this is a very really strange interior space because of so many billboards you are like surrounded by uh, uh kind of images that's uh, not really related to each other, but then somehow it's it's like become it's becoming an urban room of some sort. I really enjoy that part of Times Square. Of course, there's Shinjuku. There's a, there's a, yeah. there are many cities that has that. There's but Times Square is somehow is the strongest we have in Gangnam. But this has mm -hmm. that quality, which is really strong, and really love Times Square because of that. Yeah, there's an intensity that really draws you to a, yeah, a smaller yeah. scale than the space yeah, in which you actually yeah. find yourself. Yeah, it's uh, really so. I mean, maybe these things really. That's why I choose this drawing because chose this drawing because of my tendencies and propensities and my understanding and my likings all tended to this drawing and also the idea of architecture as a kind of a. A possibility of not building architecture anymore not anymore but some parts of architecture that is becoming independent of a physical existence but as a as an existence in augmented reality or virtual reality we've had this long time ago right we had second life and all that but if this happens in a real scale and if it changes you know we had a vessel right in uh, hudson vessel by um what's his name heatherwick mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's that reminds me. It almost feels like it's like it's like that. It's almost like it's uh, architectment. Yeah, in real life. So, I think some things you could uh, it could exist in a in a hologram, but you can experience it at home. Something like that. I don't know. So there's a part of architecture that can be a spatial experience. Let's call it spatial experience, not architecture, but spatial experience in games, in movies, 
in real life or fused in becoming a kind of a new genre, maybe someday. I don't know. That could be possible. Yeah. Yeah. So this is so one. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. This does have a kind of game like quality to it. Yeah. 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 Well. I mean, yeah. there's moments that are incredibly photorealistic, and then there's other moments that are intentionally blurred, right? And yeah, it's yeah, yeah. That augmentation being overlaid. Yeah, I, yeah. Because because I know that we cannot focus at everything at once. We yeah. think we are focusing at everything at once, but we are blurring everything else, but except the focal point, right? Mm -hmm. So I think this is sort of reminiscent of exp expressing that thing. I don't know how much thought he, you know, he or she did it, but maybe I'm reading too much of it, but, or maybe less than what he thought about or she thought about, but I'm saying this is kind of a, 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 a this is a kind of a, a kind of a, uh, how do you say, uh, itinerary of uh, kind of a, a map of what, what architecture can be. It's a signage. It's, I'm not saying this is the greatest invention of a form or anything, but I think, but this, this image, sort of portrays a potential and possibility of where architecture would go. Yeah. That's why I liked it. Yeah, that's that's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. <clears throat> Pardon me. <clears throat> and the, this tower in the middle, I mean, it reads as billboard. It reads as augmented reality. It also reads as inhabitable, right? There are these yeah, it looks like, a, and it looks like even a guy with a with a hood. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you can read into it, so it, it can be anything, it can be, so I, yeah, I, th I think, I am not necessarily saying dystopian or that uh, all these computer generated images take over, I'm saying it's one of the things that you, you are looking at, you are being hallucinated through technology, hallucinated through technology, so it's a different kind of, you know, maybe you can even see miracles, you can, <laughs> miracles, you know, <laughs> everyone see different things. And so what I'm thinking is that only you see what you want to see in the Times Square. I think mm -hmm. that could be possible. Not just yeah, one image, true. but everyone has a different image of it. Yeah. That's something that actually came up with several projects in a different way uh, with each, but this idea that a drawing that is clear enough about what it's saying, mm. that it's readable, but it's mm. open enough to allow someone else to read into it, right? That there's, yeah, a, yeah, there's yeah. a different set of interpretations. Yeah, I think that's the best kind of drawing, isn't it? That's what we say with a great work of art is that it, it conveys what the content intention of the artist is, but then it's still open that we can, you know, we can gap it in with the, our imagination or our narratives to bridge in whatever that is. So yeah. I think that's, a, a, I think that's one of the, a great drawing or great work is always that that it's open so you can you know go inside and travel in it you know not too tight it's it has openings where you can come in and yeah, there's porosity in it you know i think that's a great work yeah, yeah. wonderful wonderful yeah. thank you any anything else about this no i think i've talked too much about too too much today <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I, I know I've great really moderator you are. You are a great moderator, so that's why I've been talking too much. I should have been, you know, I should have been silent five, ten minutes ago. But I'm talking too much. Yeah. No, I, I really, really appreciated your insight into these because yeah. yeah. I, I think, <clears throat> well, first of all, the insight into the drawings themselves is absolutely in incredible, and then even beyond just the insight into these specific drawings, the way that you're talking about um, notions of drawing, notions of design, but really like there's a kind of presence of living in how you're talking about these. There's a yeah, 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 there's yeah, an yeah, interest yeah. in these even beyond drawing, so to speak. Yeah, because you can, you can uh, go into the drawing and bring it out like a book of magic, you know? <laughs> Let's talk about the animation. As a, as a filmmaker, I kind of love how this starts out with just the simplicity of the shadows. It, it's like a figure ground. And while that was sort of risky because you almost are moving through these entries so fast, you don't 
it, you don't expect a slow burn cinema piece to, to kind of show up, but that becomes what this is. And as it opens up about 20 seconds in and you, you start to realize the story and it's very beautiful and striking on the first impression. And then you read the description of it and it's uh, about something so heavy as a nuclear bombing. Well, what's great about this is that you, you know, you really can't tell what program this was really made in. You can't tell if it's hand rendered, like it's a pastel drawing animation, uh, kind of like a stop motion or if it's digital. Um, and that's really nice. And you really get the essence of somebody painting with light. It has a really strong narrative. Um, but I think what's also equally important uh, with animations, with video, the possibility that maybe there is not a narrative and that things do not have to make sense. There were a few entries where that's ex that was exactly the case, and they really did uh, kind of harness the power of audio also, which is something uh, that when you're creating video, you do want to kind of address. So here we have... Um, what really feels like the genesis of an idea, right? So it's deliberate in the sense that you're seeing a particular world or environment, but it's also fragmented. So it's almost like some, this person really delved into their subconscious to produce artifacts that you can analyze and make something out of it. Uh, this is the digital mixed media for students. Uh, to quote the great art historian Richard Bertel, um, before knowing anything about a piece of art or the concept or how it's made, it must speak to you. And Village for an Art Forger completely speaks to me, both in color palette and in its abilities as an almost cabinet of curiosities. So initially, uh, when looking at this drawing, we were kind of zooming in and looking at um, the characters that were being used. And they were highly reminiscent of uh, a painting called um, The Garden of Earthly Delights by Hieronymus Bosch. And that particular painting is, is a triptych. So it has a narrative that spans three panels and it is actually about the, the fall of man. You know, it has certain religious implications and esoteric implications. Um, so in the context of that art history, when we see this work, we start to understand that this is created also in a triptych. So on the far left-hand side, we see a, uh, like a plan form in a cruciform shape and understand it as a, uh, it's alluding to classical architecture. In the center, we begin to see elements of modern and contemporary architecture. We see like a um, Robert Venturi, it looks like a Hayduct. And then on the far right-hand side, we begin to understand that panel as like we see architecture that is embedded within the landscape or submerged within the landscape. Um, and so it, you begin to understand one narrative as potentially being past, present, future, you know, like is future perhaps like the harmony of uh, architecture with the environment. Um, but also there's like wonderful elements of art history within this too. Um, so when we start to zoom in, we start to see um, like remnants of the birth of Venus uh, the Sphinx, Botticelli, and Matisse um, that really kind of adds a secondary layer of narrative to this work. I think this piece is really strong because it does incorporate elements of architecture and art history and, and a narrative um, and a very complex narrative. You know, for you to be able to kind of go through the process of understanding it through so many different lenses is what makes it so incredible. And it's just a beautiful piece, just in general. I really enjoyed the, the storytelling through art and architecture history and the skillful color and composition. This color palette really spoke to us. As filmmakers, I'm really drawn to the kind of rainbow color palette of Wes Anderson, who's 
um, a director I absolutely love. And the attention to detail, texture, line weight, and it becomes sort of a mythological Where's Waldo? You're kind of zooming in, seeing the details. And I would almost, I would really love to see this printed large. So you kind of just are searching over the piece and seeing all the little stories that are taking place. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about your two juror citations. We can go in either order, whoever wants to go first. Great, so we'll talk about Sarah's first. This is, this is a digital hybrid professional. So this piece in particular, there were quite a few votes on this work just because it has like a really clever investigation of framing, scale, nostalgia, um, and also, you know, elements of the tangible versus the digital. What we're looking at is we're looking at a computer screen that has a, um, like almost like an export of their architectural model juxtaposed next to like a JPEG of the physical model that has been photographed. Um, and then in the background, we see the actual physical model. So we're, we're looking at the, this duality of the digital versus the real, but also the whole thing is digital. The personality of somebody that would make this is phenomenal. Like there's, there's a really great sense of um, comedy to this, especially when you're looking at the tape over the camera on the laptop. Um, and so looking at this drawing, we're looking at uh, somebody that's rendered in a, a project, but also we're talking about somebody that has a fantastic personality, fantastic sense of humor, somebody that you would want to work with. You know, that's 50% of the job is having that wonderful personality, that sense of humor that people want to be around. Yeah, that's great. And I know a, a couple of the things that came out of the deliberation, just to echo what you said, Sarah, is this was, one juror called this a super clever tableau, right? Like the, the setup of it. And a, the other person said that the, the real versus illusion balance was special, right? that this project actually really spoke to a lot of people. And I love the three different vantage points on this. Right, you see this object three times, twice on the screen, and then once in the background, and it's quite different in each vantage point, right? Like whether it's from a different end or, or what's being viewed, um, there is this, this like uh, speaking to process that I think is really, really fantastic. So here we are talking about Daniel's uh, jury citation, was it, which is in the student mixed media category. And take it away, Daniel. Uh, as a filmmaker, what really drew my eye to this piece is it's very cinematic. You're, you kind of look at it and it's like the lighting is very subtle. It's almost like they started with, with black or with darkness and subtly added in the details. So that already gives you kind of a, this wonderful, uneasy feeling. But then as you zoom into the details and see kind of these semi-disturbing images of people kind of strung up with these wires you kind of wonder what what kind of mystery is going on here, and then you you're able to see the the description of it, and you realize that this image is actually a cautionary tale of what could happen with virtual reality if we're not careful. In this depiction of what could be a crazy future, the AI is actually personified as someone sitting on a throne, and there's there's sort of a democratic debate among the people. So we don't know if these, these people are human or if this is the next generation post-human, but either way, it kind of told a cinematic story for me that uh, really spoke to me and I thought it stood out as different. It's a, a dystopian future with a dark narrative. I love the, the, master of, the mastery of light and um, and atmosphere with the sort of smoky texture. Yeah, and what uh, another thing that we found really fascinating about this work is that this person is really evaluating and thinking about what the virtual reality is going to look like. And what if, you know, in the future, if you enter a building and you are 
utilizing augmented reality, virtual reality, any of those things. And your experience of the building is very much different than someone else's. Um, for, for example, you know, Daniel and I travel all the time for work and we're constantly through airports. There's, you know, usually airports will have like a religious room where people can go in and, you know, pray there or do whatever they need to do. So, I mean, digital with the digital realities uh, of the future, it's like you could actually go in there with augmented reality technology, virtual reality technology, and experience that space as a cathedral or a mosque or a many any number of things. So what I like about this is that this student is really thinking about the integration of humans, um, digital technologies, and how that will actually affect uh, the, the very near reality. So yeah, that was one of the things that we really enjoyed about this work. And, the, and like Daniel was saying, the lighting is extremely cinematic and that's not an easy thing to do digitally, like within your rendering programs. I would say the, <clears throat> I think all four jurors mentioned the atmospherics of this from the, uh, the light to the smoke into the fog uh, that was striking, right? That it had a certain presence. And it's, it's not like you're looking through nothing to this stuff that's in the background. You almost see all of the oxygen between you and the person on the road at the, left, at the back of the drone. 